First thing, thank you very much everyone for coming and thank you very much Chris for uh, hosting and arranging everything. So, my name is Ariel Finkelstein. <laughs> and I'll tell you a little bit regarding myself in a second. But I want to tell you uh, a point that is very relevant for you guys, okay? Uh, startup wannabes, okay? Uh, I got to open many, many companies, but the first company I opened, do you know what the first thing I did before I opened the company? I went to my wife and I asked her, can I open a company? <laughs> we don't talk about these things, by the way, okay? Not a lot, okay? Uh, and that's one of the things that are very, very much important in life, okay? When we do these kind of things, the only reason I'm successful today is because of my wife, okay? I would never be able to do what I'm doing today without her willing to help me and supporting me in this kind of a situation. And why am I telling you that? Because at the end of the day, you're all, oh, if you want to be a startup founders, you're fucking crazy, okay? We're something here in our heads are not 100% okay. It's always an ups and downs. Uh, my wife always joked at me uh, every time I said, now this week is like very, very hectic. We have this and this. She said like every week and every day is like hectic. What are you talking about? It's really crazy. It's ups and downs. And in only in one place it looks good. Newspapers, okay? At the end, exits, whatever. Never, never easy. I, well, I had one company that was very, very easy, but you need to win lottery. It, it's really ups and down, and you need to be very much consistent. Uh, consistency is very, very much important when you build these kind of companies. So I'm going to talk about it today, but this is for you guys. So if you have any questions, any thoughts, any stuff, I want you to ask them. We'll have about 15 minutes afterwards to, uh, to have for the questions and everything. I'll try to touch, there's a lot of stuff. I'm not going to be able to touch everything, but I'll try to touch specifically things here in Poland, and I'll start. So, a little bit regarding myself. I'm Israeli, uh, so shalom. And uh, I started to, to build companies many years back, um, and when I started to do that, I really fell in love in building early stage companies, only online. That's only, do, I don't do offline companies, don't do hardware. I do software, I do software as a service, marketplaces, B2C, B2B, what, whatever you want. I had the pleasure of building those kind of companies. About 15 years ago, I started to invest in a way that I liked. I didn't enjoy just investing, I like building companies. And I started to build a group called TeamX, a group of friends of mine. We're all serial entrepreneurs and professionals from all around the globe, about 50 people. And we started to invest together. And all of us have the passion on building companies and helping founders to do it. And we love to come in early stages, okay? Pre-seed usually, we like to be the first investors usually, but also uh, seed. And uh, coming into companies in a way that we can really help the founders. And uh, it's a whole different model than the normal one. About seven years ago, I got here into Poland after selling two of our uh, portfolio companies, which were bootstrapped. I said, okay, let's go to CE and see what's going on. And I got to meet uh, Tom, uh, Thomas and uh, uh, we, we met, I think, first thing in Israel. Uh, but uh, then afterwards, uh, I joined forces with Innovo. I'm there already closing uh, just uh, four years just now together uh, as a venture partner. But really, it's a family and uh, all the Innovo guys are, are close friends and people that I love working with. And I got to know the industry here quite a bit. Okay, and invested into companies uh, like Zawi, if you know them, uh, Upacienta, uh, uh, More Growth, all kinds of different companies. Don't, I won't touch uh, all that. The, so I don't want to talk too much about us, so I'll just jump. What am I going to talk about today? I'll start with the first thing here that we meet in Poland. Bootstrap versus venture, okay? There's a lot of bullshit here about it, okay? And I'll try to make it very, very clear. There's no good and bad, okay? I had bad experience with bad people in venture and I had bad experience with bad people in bootstrap, okay? And I'll explain exactly how we build these th things and I'll explain when we need to do it and how to do it correctly. And I'll talk about all the different sicknesses that we have. So the first thing that we look at is us as founders. This is gonna be a very, very hard path for each and every one of you. Before I start that path, I really try to make it very clear for myself why the heck am I doing this? And what am I trying to gain out of this? 
and it's very much influential at the end of the day in my decisions. There's many, many companies that I can build them in one way or another, and I need to build it for me in a way that I want. Uh, I have founders, let's say, that did bootstrap because they wanted to have control 100%, they wanted to build it, and they wanted to build it in a way that they will not be pushed to do something that they don't want to do. And, and it's okay, and it's okay to do it. There's nothing against it. Where is the problem is when you go into a world of disalignment. Disalignment by not understanding the other side, not understanding what the VC needs and what you need, okay? Disalignment between me and my co-founder coming into these kind of situations that you don't really talk about these things and I've seen many, many, many cases like that that don't work and I'll be talking about that. Talking a little bit and that's what I'm going to touch about on venture. So I'll, I'll touch this a little bit now but afterwards uh, much more. If you don't understand the venture world, you can't go into this world and uh, really succeed. In the venture world, we have a very specific goal that we need to achieve and we need to be successful at it. And it's not always in sync to what the founder needs. Okay? And it's not that the uh, majority of the fights that you see are fights, and now today we have a lot of fights, by the way, uh, and you see them a lot in the US, is with disalignment between what the founder needs, okay, what the company needs, and what the VC needs. And this needs to be built from beginning in the right way, and I'll touch also that. Um, and then I'll talk about specifically here uh, in Poland. So let's start in the world. In order to understand bootstrap ve uh, versus venture, we need to understand the world that we are living in. So there's three different uh, main structures of companies in this world. On one hand side, we have the venture-backed companies. Venture-backed companies, we have a very clear uh, definition. Here in Poland, in a second, I'll explain. We have micro funds that don't behave in the normal way, but normal VCs, we need companies that can get to $100 million in revenues within five to seven years, okay? If you're not that, you're not gonna be the hockey stick for us. We need to return the money to our investors, the LPs. We're not able to do it if we don't have the hockey stick. Out of 20 investments that I do, one, two, really return the funds, and that's what happens in the normal way of funds. That's it. And that's the world, okay? You're not relevant for here, that's a problem. When we talk about TAM and uh, trying to understand if you have a TAM of 400 million and we do the calculation that maybe you'll get to 10% of it, you're not gonna get to 100 million, you're gonna get 40 million, you're not gonna be relevant for us. You don't understand that that's gonna be problematic. The other side of it, we have the lifestyle companies. Those are great companies, by the way, and in those cases, you're not supposed to raise money at all. These are businesses, that are real businesses, building it step by step and getting an average to between a million to three million dollars in ARR. If you build it correctly, you'll get about, uh, you should get to 40% net profit and taking that, all that to your house and it's a great business. You can become a millionaire out of it. Seen many, many, many uh, of these kind of companies and those kind of companies, if, are, if they're done well, uh, usually uh, they're successful, but in majority of the cases, the like services company, you get bored of them and many, many times you get to a plateau and then you start going down. In those cases, majority of the stuff, you, you start selling them and that's it. Bootstrap, those are companies that are valid companies. When I talk about bootstrap companies, if they're built correctly, you get to between two to four years to $10 million ARR in net profit of 40%, which means that I can give out $2 million in dividend, which I usually give out 50% of, uh, uh, of the profits at that time and you can become a millionaire out of it as a founder. Those usually are the companies that die in the hands of venture. Why? Because they get stuck between the 10 million to the 100 million, and they're exactly the cases that are the disalignment between the venture and the founder. And majority of the cases, uh, if you selected it, you didn't do it correctly. A lot of the stuff that I'm seeing here in Poland is not bootstrap. You don't focus on profitability. And the only word we know in Bootstrap is profitability. The only things that we focus on is profitability. And the only thing that in order to get to profitability is our investor. And in Bootstrap, our investor is one guy, our customer, okay? And I'm only interested in customers that are profitable to me. And I'll leave aside customers that I don't give a shit because I'm not gonna make money. For example, in venture, I'll take a customer that 
I'm going to make $1 million out of him. It's an enterprise account, but I'm going to lose money on him in the first year. Uh, it's going to cost me a million and a half, two million, I don't freaking care. But because I took this guy, I'm able to get the next funding from a VC. Because in, in that world, I build it for the next round and need the next round. And then I know that at some point of time, I will get to profitability. In Bootstrap, we don't build it that way. I would never touch that kind of a customer, and I'm not interested in him. So in the world itself, out of the 100%, we have about 1% that is relevant for, boot, uh, for venture, okay, that can really get to the 100 million. Out of it, we have now another 6%, we can talk about 6, 5, whatever it is, the number, that is relevant for Bootstrap. Those are valid companies, can get to the 10 million. And then we have a lot of companies that do not succeed, okay? I need to know where I fall and where I should go. The black and white are easy. There's a lot of gray in between. And in the gray, becomes what I want as a founder and how I want to build my company, okay? So the first thing, I'm gonna talk a little bit about in Bootstrap, but then I'll jump into venture, because in the Bootstrap world, the way we build the companies, as I said, is profitability. I have to have a clear path to profitability. I don't have a clear path to profitability, I'm gonna lose my company. That's very, very important from day one. There's specific stages in building these kind of companies. First stage is initial sales. If I don't know how to sell my first zloty shekel dollar, I'm not a founder of a bootstrap company. Second stage afterwards is break even. Now, break even is a misunderstanding here in Poland. Majority of the guys that talk about break even don't know shit about what they're talking about. Break even is not a stage that I want to be at. Not interested. I've seen so many companies here that are stuck in that stupid break even, and you waste your time. You guys are smart. We're living in times that right now, each and every one of you can enjoy for what's going on in this world. And this is a time not to waste on a specific stupid break-even uh, business. But when I build healthy companies in Bootstrap, break-even is just a step in order to get to the right way. So in average, usually it's between 30, uh, it's about $30,000 on a monthly basis of collection. I don't know if, uh, the, just to explain the terms, not revenues, not, not MRR, not ARR, not nothing collection, money that is going into my bank, okay, on a monthly level that I can allow myself to spend. That's not a lot, but it pays a little bit on the founders and everything, but I can't really build a, a serious company out of it. The next step out of it is initial profitability. Initial profitability is the amount that I can spend on a team, on SEM, or whatever it is, uh, on the stuff in order to get to profitability. In average, it's between eighty to $120,000 on a monthly basis of collection. The minute I got there, from that stage, usually I get into profitability and then I start building my company. And that profitability, usually again, the first year to year and a half, we spend all that profitability again and again into our business. That's our investments, okay? We invest and at some point in time, we start giving dividends, okay? But if we don't know these stages, if we don't build the path to success, we lose. So the main focus, if I'm not sure I can get into the profitability, I'm not interested to do a bootstrap company. So when we invest in bootstrap companies, usually we come from initial sales uh, and we're looking at the companies, but I know, I need to know that I can get into profitability and I put the gap in between. So usually it's between 300 to $600,000. You don't need more than that. And we know how to work with our founders and get to a very, very successful outcome with them. In bootstrap for the founder, and then it's very important for you to understand uh, what is the outcomes. So first thing, the ugly, we don't succeed, happens a lot like any other company. The bad, it's that it's mediocre. That's really, really annoying because you want it to be a bootstrapper. You're not really succeeding. And then you get stuck or you, or you take a little bit of money and then you lose control. All the different uh, games, that's the bad stuff. The good stuff is that we get to a situation that we're doing money. We give out dividends. We become millionaires out of dividends, by the way. Afterwards, you, we start getting M&A offers. M&A offers are between five to $10 million ARR that we do. We start getting M&A offers. Usually, the closer I enter the $10 million, the better deals I get, okay? Really depending on my profitability and everything. And the third one is when we discover that, well, we want to do a billion dollar business out of it, but we still need a little bit of money. Majority of my cases that it happened to me is when I needed to jump from SMB to enterprise and cost me a lot and I didn't have that gap and didn't want to invest and take so much uh, uh, risk between the two. 
And at that point in time, we usually take private equity and not venture uh, uh, firms because they have the same set of mind. Dividends, we love to do dividends in this business, and exit strategy. That it's the same set of mind like us. DNA of a bootstrap company is not the DNA of a venture back company, and I do not mishmash between the two. Okay? And again, as I said, it's not good or bad. It's just about building companies in the correct manner. So how do I decide on my path? First thing, you need to decide, and that's why I gave also the example of my wife. What is your aspiration? What do you want to do? Each and every one of us wants to build different companies. But in the world of venture, okay, and uh, in the world of building companies, there are companies that it's almost impossible to, to build the clear path to profitability. Enterprise products cost us a lot from day one to build them. Uh, anything in hardware, okay, costs us a lot. All the different things that I need a lot of money from the beginning and I'm not going to be able to, to build a good sales out of it, and I don't do it. There are always cases that I have a friend that did an uh, enterprise business, okay, bootstrap, but because he had like connection, he had his first customer paying him $2 million and that was like the investment, but he developed everything for, the, uh, for that product and he was able afterwards to go and sell it. Uh, but he had a clear path to that profitability and how to do it. And again, I need to be sure that I can be in this. I have a big dream. I can get to these numbers or I believe I can get there. And that's why it's relevant. In a second, we'll discuss it. In the bootstrap, I have to, I don't care about the 10, okay? I need to know that I can get to the 10 million, okay? But, uh, but usually, again, even 400, I, I get 10% is 40, 40 million. I'm very happy with the 10 million, okay? It's good enough for me. Um, a lot of times I start from bottom to top in bootstrap and start selling uh, that way. And the, I won't touch all that, but again, at the end of the day, you'll get the presentation and you'll see. What I want to focus is on the venture world and I'll talk how to do it, but before I do it, both in venture and in bootstrap, there's three pillars in early stage startups and that's very important. All these three pillars for all of you guys is important. If you're gonna build it, first thing is focus. Majority of the founders are not focused. We have so many different hats, okay? I'm a CEO, I'm a board member, I'm, uh, I'm the cleaner also, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm also uh, in the management and a gazillion different things. I'm not focused. In venture, all I care about is to get to the next funding round and I need to be sure to do that, okay? And if I don't have a clear path to that, I'm screwed, especially today. In a second, I'll talk about venture, okay? And that means that I have a very clear path for that and I'll teach you how to do that. In Bootstrap, I need to be focused on one thing. I need to get to the profitability. The minute I get to profitability, I take that knife off my neck and I know that I'm the king of the world, okay? And I can continue building my company. But people don't do that. I have in front of me all the time exactly my goals and all I care about is when all my managers come to me or my partner or whatever is, are you answering for that goal? If not, go screw yourself. I'm not interested to hear that. Especially in bootstrap, but for sure also in venture, we can lose our company very, very easily in these kind of things. Second thing is focus on one thing, one thing only in value. All of you guys have assumption. You need to understand when we build startups, we build them from an assumption. We think we found a problem in the world. We think we have a solution for that problem and we think that our solution is going to work out. But the truth is, and the fun in building companies, that it's never copy-paste. Even if you did a two, three, four different successful companies, it doesn't mean anything about your next company. And the main thing you want to know is value. And our assumption was that we can bring value. But what I love to get is that smack from the customer telling me, Ariel, you don't know shit. You, what you thought is value, it's not value for me. But what is value for me is X, Y, and Z. And that's what I'm looking for but getting that information. Majority of the founders go develop because they think that they, know they have the solution, but I don't do that. First thing I do, I go out and sell. I sell to customers, okay? I talk to them. I talk to market thought leaders. I talk to um, uh, partners and uh, uh, resellers, potential ones, and I see all the different things. And I start straight from day one to sell as much as I can, to understand as much as I can, and focus on one thing and one thing value. And the value, especially today, when every zloty in each and every one of the bu budgets of our customers is thought 10 times before they spend it. You need to understand one thing here. The guy that I'm selling, especially in B2B, in this kind of thing, I'm not talking about right now B2C, but in B2B, he can lose his job because he's spending now 60K with me. 
and it's not beneficial for the company. So he thinks twice before he does that. And he needs to be sure that he's not going to lose his job because of that. And then execution. The majority of the founders don't execute well. They get blurred, too much noise. I need to open up offices, I need to do this, blah, 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 blah. and they forget. And time runs very fast, okay? Doesn't matter, even if I got $18 million investment, I'm gonna spend them in 18 months to 24 months, same thing like uh, the, the one million that I got. Passes like this. Every month that I'm losing is a month that I'm losing the time to get to where I need to. Execution, if I'm not focused, I don't know the value and I'm not executing well, I'm gonna lose my company. That's exactly what happens to many, many companies, especially because the founder is just not strong enough. And I'll stop here. Now I'm gonna move into venture world, okay? Majority of you guys, I'm guessing, are in the venture world. So first thing, my dear partner, Michal, wasn't happy with me to talk about a round. I'll explain why I'm talking about A-Round. In a second, I'm going to talk about you guys, how to do the, the seed, the pre-seed, and all those events. In order to understand the world and understand why I'm talking about this, you need to understand what happened in the world. 2020 and 2021 were uh, crazy times, and we had the pyramid game. I don't know if you know the pyramid schemes, okay? But that was the thing that happened here. We were playing. Till then, me as an angel, a micro fund, or whatever, to exit a company was almost impossible, okay? I needed to give a, a discount between 10 to 50% on the valuation of the company. In 2020 and 2021, I can go out and get an up of to between 10 to 20% on the current uh, fu uh, funding rounds. We did a lot of money. Whoever was smart exited companies, okay, at that point of time. It was crazy time. Valuations were crazy. What happened was money was very, very cheap and people didn't know what, where to put it. And a lot of funds got money that should get that money. And a lot of funds are going to vanish, okay? You don't see it enough here. Here it's uh, a little bit more la-la land in, in that sense. In seconds we'll talk about it. But in the US, what happens, and that's what's happening from the beginning of 2022, it's finished, okay? It started from the enterprise, uh, from the later stage investment, and went into the early stage investments. The situation right now is very, very clear. Majority of those funds have portfolio that sucks, okay? Portfolio, they have 30, 40, 50x on revenue investments, okay? That for sure will need to do a down round. Uh, although the company still didn't need to raise, so, and they will need to raise in 2024, 2025. So they have a problem with their current uh, portfolio. Second problem, their LPs are not interested to invest anymore because it doesn't make any sense anymore for an LP to put money because if I can get 7% of my money in the bank without taking any risks, which turns out to be 1.8 to 2% to uh, uh, in the 10 years that I need to put it in a venture, I prefer not taking any risk going when the venture, in the good case, do 3x. Why should I take that risk? So it becomes much more less interesting and that's why you see all the funds vanishing. So they need to do one thing, and you need to understand your partner that you're going in, and then your partner, because right now we're in a time that your investor is your partner, and you want him to be your partner. In a sense that if you don't understand his business, then you're screwed. The VC world is very simple. All of them are very much afraid that they will not be able to raise the next fund. And there are going to be a lot of those that will not, especially the new ones and everything. And what's happening is that they have a year or two to do very good investments that very quickly will prove themselves as successful. Yes, on the table and everything, and I'll be able to see it. But are you these guys? And that's why they're very much concerned. A good friend of mine asked me yesterday, like, uh, what's going on with the VC world? Isn't it supposed to be taking risks? So we're right now in zero risk environment in the venture world. You have to put it into your mind. So what happens is that the entire situation changed and it's becoming much, much harder to raise money, okay? And in the US and in Israel, here it's a little bit less, okay? In tech, and what happened was early stage investment, okay? The pre-seed is very, very hard. So a lot of startups started to bootstrap there in that segment, okay? Because angels stopped to invest, micro funds uh, went a little bit higher in, in the sun. And it's very hard to do the A round because all the A round guys went down into the seed rounds, okay? And the only gambling on, on, on those ones and only the really good ones go up. So a smart investment today and a smart founder are only interested in the venture world if I'm sure I can get to a successful A round. Now, 
Poland is behaving differently. But if you guys have big dreams, and hopefully, again, whoever wants to do venture has to have big dreams, you want to get out of here. You want to be international. You want to have international customers. You want to have international investors. In order to have that in my A round, I need to play their game. And I need to plan for that. And I cannot be uh, looking only at my seed or pre-seed. I need to plan for the A and I need to be sure I can get there. If not, I need to tweak my stuff. Okay? And that's why I'm talking about this and I'm going to uh, explain to you what do I need to do from each and every one of the rounds. So let's start from the beginning. In venture as founders, the first thing we need to understand is that we are not getting an investment. We are investing. Okay? Each and every one of us, I'm investing my time, my life, okay? my well-being, and my freaking 20 to 30 percent, whatever it is of my company, into this fund's money with one prospect and one prospect only. That I believe that with this money I can get to the next round and double, triple, whatever it is, my money, my shares, and it's going to be worthwhile for me. But in order to do that, I need to do five things and answer five questions in a good way. And if I don't do it, each and every round, I'm going to get screwed. So, the, uh, so when I plan my pre-seed round, I need to think about the seed round. Okay? And I answer for the seed round these five questions. And a smart investor will want to see all of them. Okay? So the first question, how much money I want to raise next round? Okay? Second question, what kind of valuation I think? But again, I paid right now 20%. It has to be a good valuation because I want to do a nice X on my investment right now on that. Okay? The third is who's the freaking investor that I'm going to take the money from? Okay? And that's very important because at the end of the day, it's not only about uh, a fund, it's a specific uh, partner. And when I'm talking about these kind of things, which is the next point, what is the KPI that they're going to look for? I need to talk to these guys and understand what they're going to look for. And the biggest problem that we have in the past year, these freaking KPIs change on a daily basis, okay? I'll give an example. In 2008, I had a company. I spoke in, it was in July 2008, I spoke with a fund, a very known fund from the US, and I asked them, what do you need from me in order to uh, put an A round on me? And they said, $1 million A round, and you're set. I said, okay, no problem. I got to them, and it was November, and I said, I'm in a run rate to get to $1 million, and it's going to be in January. They said, sorry, now it's one and a half million, and that's like the minimum, and we're also not sure it's going to be good enough for us. This is exactly what's going on right now. Okay? And that means that if I don't know what these guys, and I, that's why I need the list exactly who are the guys that I need to talk to. If I don't have that, I'm not going to be able to raise the money. And the last part is to have enough time and money in order to get to those KPIs. And this is the planning I have to have. And I have to have in front of me before I get the cash in the bank. So if I raise $1 million right now, let's say in a seed, and that's my time to get to the A round, I need to know exactly the KPIs for that A round. But I have 18 months, let's say. I need to take today, in these times, six months to raise money. But six months is not good enough. Because what happens is, yeah, I can come to the end of my money. So usually it's about nine months altogether when I want to go out. So do I have uh, the ability to get to 80% of my KPIs within the first nine months? That's not a long time. And I have to build a reasonable uh, path in order to get there. Majority of the founders, and I'm telling you, I've done it again and again and again. I'm, uh, uh, I'm one of the founders of Microsoft Accelerator, I didn't go into it, uh, Intel Ignite. I've touched thousands of companies, and I can tell you all those companies, majority, 99.99% of the cases, they didn't plan for it. Not because they're stupid, not because, it's a, because you're just not knowledgeable at this point. That's why I'm telling you this, because otherwise you're going to have all the different mistakes, and investors usually don't help us in that. They're not, not because they're just also not into They have more, uh, more pressing stuff on their hands. It's your responsibility. It's your investment. You need to take charge of that. Okay, I'm not going to go too much, but at the end of the day, each and every one different step, this is just an example. These are not the right numbers and everything, but this is an example. Each and every one of the different fields have different KPIs. You, know, you need to know in what field you are. You need to know exactly what are people are going to ask from you, and you have to get those numbers and get them from the beginning and know and be on top of it all the time. 
majority of us do these mistakes. Majority of us didn't raise enough money and we get screwed. So several different things that you have to do from the beginning. And that's, uh, let's say when I have new companies coming into uh, Intel Ignite today, the first thing I do with them is analyze their current situation. How much money do you have in the bank? What is your net cash burning, okay? What are the KPIs you need to get to? And do you have enough time and money in order to get there in, in order to raise the next round? Again, majority of them don't have. And then what, when we analyze it, the first thing I look at is can I get um, by tweaking stuff? And if not, the earliest I go to my investors, the better. If I need to go in for and ask for more money, that's why I said they're partners of ours. The minute they got in, they're in partnership with us and you need to be close to them. I need to come to them, not in saying, and I had it uh, many times that a founder would come and say, guys, I need another half a million dollars. That's not what I'm talking about. That's the worst thing. And the answer for that is go screw yourself, okay? Never. The thing is, guys, we're together. If we continue this way, we're not going to get. And here I'll show you exactly what, what I need. So this is the gap that we have. And in order for us not to get to without money to the next investor, because otherwise the next investor is going to screw us, I can get to these KPIs within this time frame. And this is my plan. Coming with a plan and showing exactly why you need this kind of a money and getting it thrown. Many times I can do it, but many times I don't. And the, the reason for that is that investment doesn't come from here. It comes from here. And whoever tells you differently, in majority of the cases, it's bullshit. Why? And I've seen many, many times. Um, Zawi, you know Zawi, anyone knows Zawi here? Zawi met many, many uh, uh, investors here in 2020 and 2019. Nobody wanted to invest uh, for a good reason. It was a red ocean market, not interesting and blah, blah, blah. In August 2020, Mihao and myself, we invested in the company. And when people heard that we invested, all the ones that said no, said yes. Nothing fucking changed in the company. Nothing, okay? But these guys saw that other people investing. Oh, that's interesting. That happens all the time, okay? Many, many, many times. Our responsibility is to create that form, okay? That's, that's exactly what we do. But I need to be able to, to create it. And not every, every founder can do it, and that's the game. So I'm going to give you uh, specific tips. I don't know how much time I have, but... Okay, five minutes, that's great. So I'm only going to touch this. There's a lot of other stuff. Maybe in my next trip here, we'll continue. But tips for the uh, pre seed I'm going to talk specifically for you guys here, okay? So when I go out for investment, majority of the founders just don't sit down and think, okay? You, first thing you need to understand, versus the bootstrap, you have a very big luxury of venture. In bootstrap, we're screwed. I have very specific investment terms in Bootstrap, by the way. Why? Because the minute I started Bootstrap with my founder or my co-founder, that's it. It's a marriage that I can't get out of it, okay? There's no other, uh, uh, I would say, uh, terms that happen in, in the life. Every funding round that I have is a time to start cleaning table, changing stuff. And well, what I plan for is what kind of control I want to have, Maybe I had a bad investor previously, I want him out on or bad terms or whatever I want. Valuations that I want to run after, and I need to think what's important for me. Valuation is today less important than other stuff. And I see here a lot of founders that are focused on the wrong things. They lose control of their companies, by the way, which in a stupid way from day one, which doesn't make any sense, okay? Expertise. There's a lot of funds here that don't have expertise and cannot help me. Everything falls on me. Do I need expertise? Is it important for me? Not always. I need to see my own specific stuff and what I do is what are my minuses? What am I missing? And do I need someone with ex expertise? Yes or no? But sometimes I do, sometimes I don't know. Sometimes it's from an investor, sometimes it's from an advisory board that I need to build. But not always an advisory board I can build because I lost control and now they're not allowing me to give them ease up or whatever it is. All that I need to plan from day one, okay? When I look at a lot of the founds, uh, founders that want to go out of here, it's very, very hard for them. I look for investors that can really take me out of here, in a sense, both for the next investors that they're really connected, really invested together with them, to customers that I want, because in the beginning, those are the connections, to partners that I can build, all those kind of things. I have my list of exactly who, what I want. Building uh, uh, the right board, it's very crucial. A board can ruin a company. If I have a bad board and I have bad relationship, it can ruin my company. All this, I write down everything, all the different points that I want to do. 
There's different kinds of investors for the pre-seed. I have the angels, okay, and here it's behaving uh, a little bit different in, in the sense that I can go and talk to these guys, it's easier, okay, and you need to build it, okay, so when I, uh, when I take, let's say, half a million, okay, I, we always look for the lead investor, okay, um, and the thing is, who can be my lead investor? How can I create that kind of formal between different lead investors, okay, but sometimes I, uh, I build it from bottom to top. Sometimes I build it in the way that I get some angels that don't pay me here. Usually angels don't put a lot of money, but you know, like the 30K, 50K, whatever it is. But I get like, an, and I'm able to say, hey, I have already 200 out of the half a million and I get it or I can do it the, the, the other way around. You need to understand also the micro funds here. Micro funds here are much more in the bootstrap world many, many times because they're not real funds in that sense because uh, it's built differently. Majority of the money is government money. We won't go into it right now. but you need to understand also their interest in how to build it and how to get to them. The thing is, each and every one of the investors, it's a b uh, different way how to talk to them. Now, one of the biggest mistakes that founders have that they think all the investors are the same thing. Every investor has their own interest. See who is really interested in your space, who made money already in your space and who likes it. Okay, in venture. Let's talk specifically here in Poland. Dream big. If you want to do a venture back company, don't freaking go into it if you don't bring, uh, dream big, okay? We want to build big companies and if you're stuck here in Poland, it's not interesting. If you're really uh, not interested to do it, don't go for it. But if you want to build a venture back company, dream big, but that's how we want to hear you. The first question that an Israeli uh, venture would ask in 2000 to 2010, a founder was, if you had an offer today to sell for $50 million, will you sell? And many of the founders said, at that point in time, we sold over our companies very early because we didn't know how to do business at that end. And that's what happened. And the, every founder that said yes, they said, okay, get out of my office, goodbye, and I'm not going to invest. The reason for that, because that's how they validated that they dream big, yes or no. You guys, you need to understand that there's a very big uh, uh, disalignment between you and a real venture fund. Again, micro fund would be very happy at 50 million. Okay, especially if it's the time to money is quick. A venture fund, a normal venture fund, if I have a fund of $100 million and I have 10% in your company, in average, that's what we should have there, and I get five million, lousy $5 million out of the sale, it doesn't help me to cover my $100 million. And I spend the time on you, and I'm not interested in that. Every investment that we do in venture has to be potentially giving you back the $100 million. Are you those guys? And that's the way we think. So if you don't bring a uh, dream big, you're not the kind of guys that are relevant for a serious venture capital firm, okay? A lot of the mistakes I'm seeing here, uh, founders that call uh, someone who they gave sweat equity a co-founder, okay? You start, uh, there's so many cap tables here that are unclean. When you build your companies, it's a, a, a co-founder is one of the biggest sickness in startups, okay? In, on one hand side, it's important. We need someone together with us many, many times. It's also very hard to invest into a sole founder many, many times uh, for different reasons. But when I build these kind of things, I look for healthy co-founders, okay? Relationship that makes sense. Don't go into it without really building a relationship. Don't start, to, okay, okay, we're together and that's what we do. Try, the, try it out. Put terms how you do that and just play with it. And at the end of the day, it's very, very crucial. And not everyone is relevant to be a co-founder. A lot of the uh, stuff that I'm seeing is uh, someone who's not a real co-founder, it's just an employee, and he can't be a founder. And he can't even be a manager many times. You have here a lot of those kind of things. You have uh, investor bankers or guys that can help you get money that becomes as if a co-founder. That's uh, shares that should not be there taking on in, into the cap table. And the only thing we, we need afterwards is to clean the table. Build a healthy cap table from day one. Okay, and think about how to do it instead of uh, um, uh, doing it in a stupid way. Next, in, in the co-founder world is that, I, let's say I have teams of three different co-founders, all of them are technical guys. And the company, majority of the staff is not the technical stuff, but the operational and sales stuff. Who's gonna do that? That's unhealthy. It's look for people that can, uh, the combination between you is a winning combination and try to build it. And many, many times when I start my companies, I first thing want to see where am I going, where I think I'm going, things can change and 
do change, but at least something that makes sense for me in the co-founder that should be there for as long as possible together with me, okay? Yeah, as I said, you have too many investors, bankers here. I do not invest in early stage in, in the founder that is going through an investor uh, banker, okay? We use investor bankers a lot, okay? In later stage, in IPOs, whatever you want. In early stage, I need each and every one of you, and I gamble on you, that you'll be able to raise the next run, uh, funding round, okay? Maya, when we met her, was not able to raise an A round. We knew it when we came in. I also told her that in the beginning. She went and she uh, uh, corrected her English much more. That was one thing. She started to learn how to interact correctly with the U.S. and the way we did it. I, said, I said to her, you're going to the U.S. She went oh, almost a month to the U.S. to understand the mentality there. And I got her to meet over 100 founders, uh, funds, whatever you want. We're not taking any investment. It was just to get to know the culture because we knew that we want to raise money from them, okay? And when you build it in that way, I needed to know that she'll be able, when we need to raise the money, she'll be able to do it. And she was able to do it. The thing is, if you come with an investor banker, if you don't know how to uh, raise a lousy pre-seed, how the fuck am I going to raise the A round together with you? I need to know that you, that you are able to do it. And getting to people and you don't give a shit. You have to have the Israeli chutzpah in that sense that there's no door that you can't open. And you have to have it because that's something which is really, really important as founders for us, in, especially in these kind of times that are not easy to raise money. One thing that we also see here, we downgrade ourselves. Okay, let's say Maya, um, I, I think it was, uh, you know Uzi, the founder of uh, Base CRM? Okay, Uzi is a friend, Base CRM was a known company here at some point in time. And I said, I said to her, uh, okay, go meet also him. She said, well, Base CRM was a known name, blah, blah, blah. And she was like excited about it. After she, she came out of the meeting, she said, ah, okay. So the thing is, many, many times we think the Americans are doing much better than us. And you need to understand, they're not. They're not better than you guys, okay? There's a lot of great founders here, great founders, okay? But a lot of them, downgrade themselves when they talk to the American. Never do that. Never do that with a customer. Never do that with a partner. Never do it with a VC. You're not less than anyone else, okay? And don't think that way. You can be humble, but don't downgrade yourself, okay? And many times in the wording uh, itself, Thomas can tell you, that's exactly what we worked in Innovo. In the beginning days of us, you were downselling us, and you remember it, and not showing exactly how successful we were in the first uh, uh, interactions. We it's not. Remember, we were always super awesome. Ah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> very good. Okay. <laughs> now you're <laughs> upselling us. <laughs> the thing is, we need to understand one thing and one thing only. Okay. A lot of things is appearances when we talk to these kind of guys, and we need to be able to do it. Uh, winning mentality and many many times I hear okay how do we do this how do I open up how do I get to these guys winners are not people that all the time whine or these kind of things we get things done and we don't really care about uh, the stuff second thing that we get a lot of companies here that are stuck in Poland for too long that's a really really problematic situation I'm not say, uh, saying don't sell here it's easy to sell initially here it's better to sell also to international brands that are here Okay, and afterwards I say that this brand bought for me. But for sure, I need to have from day one exactly when I'm getting out of here, as fast as possible. Getting international customers and getting outside of it if I want to build an international business. And if I don't have that plan, I don't know how to do it, I'm going to get uh, screwed. One last point, and again, I don't know, I have to finish. You need to understand one thing also. Here, it's still much cheaper than in the U.S. That means that what you can do here with one million, half a million, two million, whatever it is that you get here, you can do twice or three times much more than what the American person can do. Use that to your advantage, which means I prefer doing as much as I can from here with people from here, which we can. We have very good employees. Again, if we, when we go upstream into B2B enterprise, it becomes much harder. Uh, it's a whole different talk and how to do it and everything, but utilize that for your success, which means that my gross margin, okay, initially is much, much better than any American company that's in my competitors. And I can win it. Use that both for investors and also competition that you have.